Welcome back to Warrior's Den, episode 110. The guest today is Kfir Itzhaki. Kfir is the founder of Instinct, a psychology-based Krav Maga organization. He is an author. He is a Israeli hero, a former special force operator in the unit Duvdevan, and a counselor of sorts. We get into that. To get into the head of Kafir a little bit and this episode, here is a little clip. I truly believe that every person could become a hero. And I wasn't a hero in my life until I did stuff and learned how to do it. Mm. And I can teach it. And I teach it and it's possible. You don't have to be born with it. It's not like a decree or something. You can develop it. It's like a muscle. Mm. And if you will do it, then you are, you're going to be happy. Because if you are not suffering from anxiety, then you're happy. You clean anxiety, you're happy. Obsession. So everybody can be their own hero if they want to be and be a hero for other people. You just have to learn. His, his words are uh, very great, even though I didn't quote it exactly. Now, uh, I don't always read uh, guests' bios, but Kfir's bio is pretty interesting. So before we start, I'm going to read the bio that he sent to me. Kfir Itzhaki is an international speaker, author of Unconventional Weapon, The Complete Guide for Using Fear. Currently only available in Hero, Hebrew, sorry, but uh, he has an online course in English uh, expanding on the book. He's a mediator and the head of a worldwide organization in self-defense and psychology, Teachings Instinct IIC. Kfir was a professional martial arts competitor and won the Israeli Karate Championships. Prior to enlisting in the IDF, he was on the verge of losing his eyesight following a surgical operation. In his military service, which included an extended service, he served as an operator and the head of combat training at Duvdvan, IDF's elite counter-terrorist unit. During the period, training period, he lost his short-term memory as a result of a training accident, and after completing the training period, he was sent to represent his unit in the IDF's Karate Championships, where he won gold medal. Kafir completed the IDF's Krav Maga instructor course, as well as IDF senior instructor course, with the highest ranking, and was selected as an excelled instructor in both courses. As a civilian, Kfir was awarded two civilian medals of bravery and heroism after saving a girl from getting raped and following another incident in which he chased and took over a terrorist with his bare hands during one of the most severe stabbing attacks during the Knife Intifada. During the terror attack, an event he was not involved with at all before his intervention, Kfir himself was injured. Despite the injury and extreme turn in his life, Kfir decided to finish his law studies and continue to lead the organization he founded. His actions and contributions to the safety of the state of Israel have received international recognition in many media outlets around the world, and he has been awarded the prestigious Garden of Israel Award by Stand With Us organizations. Thousands of people attended the award ceremony in Los Angeles, including ambassadors, IDF, and U.S. Army officials, as well as former Israeli-American security force personnel. That is quite the bio. Now, I had never met Kfir prior to asking him. He invited me to join his Facebook group. And then I thought, you know, this would be an interesting person to talk to. Uh, me and him connected on the idea that Kramaga can't just be about crazy, aggressive rage anymore. It has to be technique. It has to be principle. It has to be psychologically driven. You need to modernize the system. And this is something that Kfir has done with his organization, Instinct. And this, to me, was a very fascinating uh, discussion, as he really knows what he's talking about. Now, if you want to connect with Kfir personally or learn under him, uh, let's pull up here. There we go. If you can see on the share screen, you can follow him personally on Instagram, Kfir underscore Itzhaki. You can follow his organization, Instinct underscore IIC. You can uh, contact him via Facebook, Kfir Itzhaki. Though I notice he's almost at the capacity of friends, which is, I think, 5,000, unless that has since changed. Um, let me just pull my screen so I can get up the next one. 
You can also follow him on uh, YouTube. He's got all sorts of Krav Maga demonstration psychology. Some of it's in Hebrew, but I believe uh, in, uh, there'll probably be subtitles. Some of it's in English. Now, if you notice here for the video people, the uh, video he has profiled, uh, you can't see without accessing it directly, but it's actually a video uh, and discussion of the time that he tackled the knife wielder. There's video footage and you can see how intense that situation actually was. So I hope, uh, you know, uh, I love talking to all the uh, people in the Kramaga world that I'm able to, to contact with. And Kfir was certainly no exception to that. It was a wonderful conversation on Kramaga, on teaching, on psychology, uh, how to be a better person. He discusses his book a little bit at the end. Uh, I hope you enjoy this one as much as I do. Of course, can't forget the sponsors before the podcast. So enjoy the repetitive sponsors video and then this awesome podcast. Thank you for listening to the Warrior's Den podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Urban Tactics Krav Maga, turning lambs into lions since 2013. If you like this podcast and our content, make sure you support us in the many various ways you can. The easy and free ways start with liking, subscribing, following, and leaving a positive review wherever you may be listening or watching. You can also follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram at Urban Tactics Krav Maga, and Twitter at Urban Tactics KM. You can also follow us on YouTube and Rumble at Urban Tactics Krav Maga. Another great way to support this podcast, as well as our other content, is to check out our blog at www.utkmblog.com. Here you can check out our weekly curriculum, our various blog posts, and general ideas about Krav Maga and self-defense. For those of you feeling generous, you can also click on the Support Us tab and send donations our way so we can continue providing the awesome content you love. And for those who would like a little more for their money, you can check out www.utkmu.com and learn Krav Maga and self-defense online as we teach it at our school. You can check out the various levels of curriculum with monthly or annual subscriptions and learn Krav Maga so that you too can walk in peace. Small disclaimer, UTKMU is meant to supplement your regular Krav Maga self-defense or martial arts training in person with qualified instructors and is not a substitute for in-person real training. And for those of you who want to look as good as I know you feel, you can always check out www.utkmshop.com where you can check out and buy the latest UTKM merch from us. Warning, wearing UTKM merch will not turn you from a lamb to a lion. To start your transformation from lamb to lion, you must start your training journey today. Stay consistent and never give up wherever you may be. Side effects of wearing UTKM merch may be chronic bouts of kicking ass, feeling good, and learning to walk in peace. And of course, if you are in the Metro Vancouver area, come train with us in person. Sign up at www.urbantacticskm.com. I would love to help you on your journey from lamb into lion. And now, back to the episode. Krav Maga is not just a self-defense system. It is a way of life. Warriors Den is a podcast for Kravists, fighters, martial artists, warriors, politicians, and general citizens. Consider this. The society that separates scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. Lucididi, your host, Jonathan Fader, talks to guests in an open and uncensored format about their fights, their philosophies, and their lives. No topic is taboo, and the conversation may start in one place and end in another. As the quote suggests, you cannot separate the warrior from the politics and the world around them, as a true warrior must be a student in all forms of art and science. You're listening to The Warrior's Day. The Warrior's Day. Brought to you by Urban Tactics Krav Maga. Turning lambs into lions. Okay, welcome back. I am here with uh, Kafir Yutaki, uh, Kravist, martial artist, author, and psychology and self-defense expert. How are you today? Good. How awesome. are you, Jonathan? I'm doing great. It's a good day for me so far. So, And now even better, of course. <clears throat> uh, so I thought a good place to start, as I often do, is uh, where does your martial arts and Krav Maga 
experience start in your life journey? At the age of five, I began practicing martial arts. And just not the regular way because my dad was really, let's say, uh, obsessed on the training. It, it wasn't like uh, another, you know, you go to ceramics, to piano, to guitar, and to, to, and to karate. In, in my case, uh, it was something that the whole house was talking about all the time, and my dad put a lot of pressure on that, so I, I didn't miss classes, and I was really forced, let's say, to, 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 to train uh, with a constant training, hard training, and this eventually pushed me. To, to become and then i proceeded uh, in the in the in the gym there was always krav maga one day in a week there was self defense and the rest was other martial arts mm -hmm. so i was always involved in, in krav maga and uh, in the military it already you know spread to be uh, like a real professional krav maga in the, mm -hmm. in the union mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I read your bio that you sent me, and I didn't know some of that that stuff. Even before you got in the military, it sounds like you had some rough, rough time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you prior? Because you your your organization is uh, Instinct. Uh, were you with any major organizations prior, or was it just like a generic uh, a club? Because I'm always interested in like the lineage, who did what and where. Yeah. Uh, no, I was not part of uh, of any federation. Let's mm. say uh, I was in martial arts federation, but not Krav Maga mm. federation. And, uh, I would say that my federation is Dudevan unit. Yeah, Dudevan unit. For those who don't yeah. know, it's a, a very famous uh, Mr. Ravim undercover uh, unit in the West Bank, known for its Krav Maga, made famous uh, in the Western world by uh, the book uh, Brotherhood of Warriors by Aaron Cohen. I'm sure you you're familiar with it <laughs> yeah so the unit i actually wanted to get into but that did not work out well for me <laughs> well you know it's sometimes it's not really up to you it's a lot of yeah so of many course. circumstances need to gather around you know to be accepted to the unit. not only your physical and mental abilities so uh, mm. yeah well, first step was getting into paratroopers. They didn't want me. <laughs> then other oh. people didn't want me. Then I ended up in uh, a Givati, if you can see here. There, so <clears throat> but it's interesting. Nice. Yeah, the yeah. purple bullet. <laughs> yeah, it's a good color. <clears throat> so, because uh, you also did karate early on, and you became a karate champion, correct? Yes, I was. Yeah. Uh, I was doing a lot of karate, and uh, I was the Israeli champion mm. for the military. I was uh, training professionally and I also went to, to, to compete abroad outside of Israel. And at the age of 16, I had groups. I, already was, I was an instructor already at the end of 16. Mm. So the instructional mm. experience begins pretty early, I would say, even before that. But I had my group like paying groups, you know, like as a profession, I was earning money at the age of 16, uh, let's say half, like, like uh, half part, half time job. Um, so it gave me a lot of motivation to, you know, because you see a lot of students coming and then I gain, I gained a lot of experience before the army already. It was a great time. Yeah. And, uh, I was, there was a lot of talking about taking me into the Israeli team. Hmm. national team but eventually i decided to i was pondering and pondering and pondering and pondering whether i go to the military uh, combat or i go to be uh, an athlete like an, a professional athlete in, in the idf eventually i decided that uh, i'm gonna go be combat it's probably uh the right choice right because <laughs> uh correct me if i'm wrong uh a lot of people don't know this if you're a top athlete in your sport in israel you can just do be an athlete instead of going to the military right yes you can be yeah. an athlete and this is promoting your career good money career prestige and you take care of yourself and you do whatever you like it you don't don't even need to wear them almost uniform mm. if you're training it's like a dream for the martial artists, but um, you know, my my brothers and my father, we all they want all went to combat, and for me, I understood that uh, you know, 
you need to I, I, I need to give something to the to this country and mm. I decided to go to the most combat unit that I could and also I knew that in Dudevan there was a lot of Krav Maga so I said to myself innocently um, let's go to Krav to Dudevan there is Krav Maga I will be good at that but in a second I will tell you that <laughs> after a couple of months I almost regretted, regretted it just a second I'm trying to share the, the Facebook live mm. okay. Ha he's having some technical difficulties because computers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Can you speak Hebrew, by the way, Jonathan? Mamash uh, Katsat. <laughs> I, I, I learned Hebrew for the military. I went to Ulpan before I went to the military. I was getting okay. And then I ended up in a place where everyone spoke or understood English. And then in the army, my Hebrew went out the window because except over the radio, I would just spoke English anyway. So <laughs> That's surprising. Yeah, yeah. Trying to learn Hebrew, but you, don't, you cannot because the Israelis, we, like, we love to practice English, you know? Yeah. Well, I actually ended up in, in uh, a squad of Salafim, and uh, they, except for the two guys uh, that didn't speak English, uh, they all spoke English because they were either American descent or very education, educated Russians. Uh, there was a, a guy who grew up in Israel from Ukraine originally, or his, his lineage was. He didn't like to speak Hebrew, but he understood fluent English and could read and write no problem. So... We all understood each other, uh, unless they spoke Russian, then I don't speak Russian. <laughs> so it's a, it was quite a quite diverse group of people that I ended up uh, doing a lot of my time with in the end. So English is what I spoke, uh, to my detriment, I think, but it is what it is. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so as I said, I wanted to, I said that Duzevan would be good for me because mm -hmm. uh, I know Krav Maga and martial arts, etc. But in the end, the training, the, the Kavma part, Gamaga part of the training is a very is fundamental part of the training in the Devan. And for me, it was a nightmare because mm. because of my experience, so uh, the, the the commanders liked it and they, you know, tested me and they tried to uh, treat me as a rabbit, like a lab rabbit. Oh. Yeah, how many people I can cope with, I could fight, I can take to the ground. It was like a fun for them. Mm. And it was like a show, you know, they put in me a lot of people and fight, and I, it was a nightmare for me and uh, I hated it. Mm. But eventually it made me even better. And uh, that was, it was a pretty funny circle. So. Mm. Is it like, they're just like, you think you're tough karate boy? Let's go. Is it that yeah. kind of mentality? Exactly. <laughs> I have one time, I, I will not, you know, my stomach, my, my, my ribs, my right rib will never forget. When we were doing um, gun training, uh, one of my commanders came by surprise and gave me the strongest punch, strongest hook I've mm. never received. I've ever received, and I could like, and it was funny for them. Like, mm. like let's see you now, tough boy. Let's yeah. see you now. And so yeah, yeah, that was a game. Yeah, I mean, it's, it can be very dangerous. I don't know if you know uh, the famous music, uh, magician from the 1920s, like, Harry Houdini. That's exactly how he died. You know, he used to go around, uh, I can take any punch, and then some guy sucker punched him and ruptured something inside, and he died, right? So, you know, I uh, I often show old videos when I can find them of like 1970s, 1980s Krav Maga training from the IDF. I show it to my instructors usually. And and I go, this is the image that Kramaga still has today. But as we modernize, we can't do that all the time because what they found, you know, they found it even in the military. It's a million dollars per special force soldier and you get injured halfway through. It's silly. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's something I'm, I often get emails like, oh, are we going to kick the crap out of each other? And then I'm like, not as a beginner, relax. And some people come in. And they're learning the fundamentals and they're like, this isn't Krav Maga. I'm like, yes, it is. And you build them up because the average person is not a special force soldier, but everyone likes to think they are. 
<laughs> so it is certainly an image that uh, Krav Maga needs to fix a little bit. And as you can speak for yourself as how it can be quite detrimental when we train like that so all the time. So many injuries. Yeah. So many injuries. <clears throat> Myself, I was injured, like severely injured a couple of times. And so many injuries, the people that I know that left to the one unit because of the of the lack of supervision, like this is the, 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 the bad part. Mm. Uh, when I was appointed to be an instructor, the first thing I did was eliminating from the book of mm. the van, uh, rewrite and eliminate the drills that made me lose my, my, my memory. Mm. One time I lost my memory and uh, it was such a dangerous act to do. Doesn't work. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we had some formation, like, like uh, corrections to, be, to do and we did. Yeah, because uh, back then they didn't, well, some people did, but they buried it as a CTE. Uh, the more head trauma you get, the more you're un unable to function, right? I'm sure you know all about that. Uh, and I think it's only in the last five to 10 years, people have started to talk about, hey, even professional MMA fighters, it's like, hey, we you can't keep hitting each other in the head and training all the time. It's just going to wreck your career. It's like those uh, professional fighters who have an indestructible jaw, cannot get knocked out. They like to brawl, and within five years, they're getting knocked out every single time, usually. It's just not how we're built, right? Uh, now, I wanted to go ask you, because you, you did Krav Maga and Karate. I, I often find with some people who train heavy in traditional martial arts, they, they have difficulty with the self-defense aspect when integrating a traditional martial arts and self-defense application. So how, how is that sort of experience for you? That's a wonderful question and this is a, a wonderful topic because mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit silent, let's say, I would say. Uh, yeah, there is difficulty. And I would say that the more... You know, the most, the more traditional martial arts, the more difficulty to cope with Krav Maga and self-defense. So karate guys, including me, uh, they have less potential to to become, let's say, fluent in Krav Maga mm. because uh, they are very stiff, very structured, very, uh, let's say, uh, square-minded in regards to the way your body should move. Hmm. For example, hmm. in karate, you cannot hit the face with your hand. You can with your legs, but not with your... So this is... The... It's creating a blockage for your brain to function in real time. Okay, and I had to cope with it. I was successfully coping with it because we had a lot of Krav Maga in the training, as I said, once a week. But still, the transition between the Krav Maga and karate had some difficult... We had some difficulties. People who come from Muay Thai or kickboxing or MMA, they have less difficulty. People who come from Tai Chi, they have more difficulty. People who come from ballet, more difficulty. Mm -hmm. So it's just like so the, more... the rigid nature. It's like, I actually have a good start right now that I'm remembering. I was teaching at a university and this kid came in and he'd been doing, I think, Shotokan karate for many, many years. And if you're watching the video, you can see he did the very low stance with the hands like, you know, like that. Uh, away from his face and I had just been teaching uh, sort of a fighting stance or like hands up protect your head because friends all sorts of reasons and every time I say okay fighting stance his brain immediately went to the karate stance where his hands were down yeah. by his hips and I and I was like so do you accept my explanation of why you want your hands up by your head he's like yes it makes a lot of sense i'm like okay so let's try again fighting stance and every single time he just could not break his his body's movement and i'm like you're gonna get hit in the head <laughs> if you keep doing that and it's just it, i think that is a good story to emphasize if you're really into the traditional martial arts it really gets in there and it, it makes it difficult to adjust yeah i agree <clears throat> yeah um so where does psychology come into your journey? I experienced a lot of stress times and fear hmm. and anxieties and, you know, on, on operations and also as a civilian. And um, 
I was able to understand, I, I recognize that I, I have some kind of a system. Like I do something right because almost every time that I'm confronting a stressful situation, I'm, I know what I'm doing as opposed to a lot of people that I saw that were having difficulty. And so that made me understand that um, maybe there's some, something here. Like, then I, you know, was thinking about it and understood that the same, since the age of five, I'm training and doing a lot of stuff. And this is uh, in, the, in the military, it created some methods in my mind. And then retroactively, I, I began to, to study psychology and, and retroactively I understood that what I did is really, let's say, coherent with the brain. Mm. And like, I, I understood that the brain has some keys that you can work with it. The fear mechanism in particular, you can work with it and you can also have it as your enemy. And I was able to do it and I retroactively understood what I did. And then this pushed me to, to research to, to, to begin a big research on myself, and then it spread to a lot of people, to, to, to colleagues and friends and the work and in the organization. I, ha I, I was really curious to understand what I did right and modeling people who did it right. And so it basically, would, I would say from the experience in field, I saw the difference of reaction between people. And I said, I want to know what's going on in, what's going on in their minds. Mm. Why aren't you succeeding and he is succeeding? And this, you know, it's not a game. It's life or death. I remember one time on an operation, they couldn't take down the terrorists, like physically to arrest him. Not because they don't know the technique, because they were freezing. They were afraid it was like a big terrorist. And they know the technique, you can do it. But still the fear was controlling them. And the more cases I faced, I understood I have to investigate the human mind, mm. the combat psychology in particular. So in the combat psychology, let's say I did my own small PhD, and then it elaborated to many other aspects. And today I'm, I'm, I'm relating it to, I'm, I'm working with a lot of, uh, let's say, disorders, mm. anxiety disorders, panic attacks, phobias, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, depression, obsessions, broken heart. Like, uh, by the way, this is my clinic here in Israel. This is mm. I have uh, my own clinic where I get uh, people with a lot of different different uh, challenges in their lives. And uh, I would say that the combat was a strong motivator. And for me, I, this is something that I want to tell to all our our listeners. One of the best ways to, to be happy and healthy in your mind and soul is to train Krav Maga and to train martial arts. And what is the reason? The reason is, first of all, body in movement, your spirit is in movement. If your body is moving, your spirit is moving. And a healthy spirit is a moving spirit. Like if you're not, if you don't do anything all day long, Step by step, you will become depressed. And when the mind understands that the body is moving, it says, okay, the subconscious says, if the body is moving, it means that something good is going on. We are always in the movement. Okay, if we're in the movement, then everything is okay. We are moving on, and then I will be happy. I will be more motivated and with energy. Because the subconscious does not differentiate between reality and imagination. This is why... You can do a test with me, the listeners, right now. Throw your hands into the air five times, strong, fast. Immediately, your mind will receive the command. Something good has happened. And it doesn't matter if you know that it's a game. It doesn't differentiate between reality and imagination. The martial arts and the Kav Maga, they're bringing so much value. I don't care about the techniques now. I'm not talking about the techniques. I'm not talking about the cells of security even. I'm just talking about the movement of the body. This is the first idea. Second um, is the self-esteem part. Men for many particular, we have uh, three topics that we confront throughout our lives. And some of us 
try to keep it silent. They're ashamed of it. They're afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to say that it's a challenge. You want to know the three? Sure, of course. <laughs> First is um, Krav Maga, like street fighting. Hmm. We have a fear that someone will attack us and we don't feel, we, we feel, uh, we don't feel superior most of the time. Even as instructors, we have sometimes our times that we are you know, afraid, we're not securing with, with ourselves. And this is because uh, this is a very fundamental part in our lives because we need to prove our, our manlyhood. We need to prove that we're strong, we are capable, and we can protect the children, the wife, and whatever. And this is a big topic that you have to, to, to have it in your life. You cannot just be a successful uh, businessman and not coping with that because you're not coping with that. Something will, you know, something will tickle you. It will bother you. You have to deal with that. Another topic is uh, women. Okay. Your relationship with women your ability to communicate with women, to have intimacy with women, to have romantic with women. This is uh, another part that is, uh, uh, let's say bother us. And we need to confront throughout our lives. You know, some people take it to the extent. So they are trying to be with as many women in their life as possible, which of course this is excess and harming them. But because this is a territory that we need to confront and deal. So the women part. The third part is the money part. Mm. Making money. And I would say making money slash career, having a, a successful career, which is usually goes together. So, because you need to be capable. So money, women, and Krav Maga. <laughs> and we are, we are Jonathan and all our listeners, we are in charge of of a very, very important part, Krav Maga. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I, like for me, I can speak for myself, you know, I've always been hot headed, I guess I a very aggressive person naturally, which is it worked out from a self defense perspective as a much smaller person, it, you know, it keeps people, you know, the predators away a little bit. Um, but I remember uh, when I was in high school, I only got in one fight. Uh, the initial conflict was a, like a legitimate self-defense. I said something, they attacked me. Uh, I hesitated, which I should not have because I could have done, it would have been over. And then later afterwards, I agreed to a fight. Now, this guy was uh, uh, much taller than me. He didn't know how to fight either, but the physics of it, he's a bigger guy. Uh, you know, he hit me. I split open my eyebrow. I'm sure watching it, it looked like the most ridiculous thing in the world. But uh, I remember feeling very inadequate, you unable to fight. <clears throat> and it wasn't until uh, I was a little older as an adult, had my own money and time that I'm like, I need to learn to fight. I actually started Krav Maga because uh, I wanted to learn prior to going to the Israeli military. So I was fortunate that that was there. And then later on, as a, a Krav Maga practitioner, I realized I don't know how to wrestle, grapple, or choke people out. So I started doing jujitsu because I went up against some grapplers and they, I felt inadequate again. And it's like, I, I need to learn these skills. And I can say, uh, even though I don't train as much as uh, I tell my students to, uh, if I don't train once a week or twice a week regularly, I can, it's, it's a problem. You can feel it. Like I was sick a month ago. I couldn't do any training. And then I actually you know, said to my wife, like, because I used to have clinical depression, which is mostly mostly gone now. I actually could feel the depression coming back. And I was like, I, I need to get back to training. Like, I have to go back to training as soon as I'm feeling better. And as soon as I started training again, it just gone. Uh, this is after, you know, my whole life is struggling with depression and, and, and fixing it myself <clears throat> through various methods. And then I, I, can, I can say, you know, my experience, your experience... And the research that that is is regardless of what people believe it's, it's so ingrained in the genetics of men that we need to do this and unfortunately i don't know well so israel is changing a bit but here it's being removed from schools it's being told still by a lot of circles like it'll make you more violent 
And anyone who does it is like, that's not true. We need our, our young kids learning martial arts early for the reasons that everyone thinks traditionally, like confidence and l at least physical health, learn to use your body. So I, I can definitely agree with uh, your sentiment there <clears throat> on those topics. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, uh, just to... Hmm? It's even, it's a, I would say it's, it could actually save your life, not on the street, but at home. Hmm. The relationships, in your friendships, in your work, because this is such, as you said, such a fundamental need of your spirit, the movement, the physical movement. Mm. So it's not something like a privilege. I would say it's like the bread and butter of mental health. Mm. Yeah, uh, definitely. The research also uh, indicates that. Now, I, just to clarify for anyone listening, are you a clinical psychologist or a counselor or what is exactly the exact e education or title? Not that I care, but you know, some people yeah. might be interested. So my train, my, uh, I'm not a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. I have a degree in law, uh, but I don't, I didn't took it to, let's say, to, to the academic, official academic uh, channel, mm -hmm. because I understood that this is not where I want to be. This is too slow. This is, uh, I would say like there are the advantages, but I think I, I talk about it a lot in my book, uh, the differences between uh, classic psychology and uh, not classic psychology. So I did a lot of internships and uh, courses in uh, the, the whole world of psychology. And uh, so I, I, I did basically, I, I consuming so much knowledge mm. and also mm -hmm. implement it really fast because remember that the, all, all of these years I'm training people. Like I, I, I never had the time when I just learned. It was always learning mm. and learning and implementing it on people, on myself. And this helped me gain a lot of experience in therapy. Mm. Like there are some stuff that I'm not legally, no, I'm not giving pills. Uh, I, I, I am not, I'm not a psychiatrist. Mm. So I'm not going there and I'm not treating people, uh, let's say with uh, no schizophrenia or MPD, multiple personality disorder. This is not what I do. This I leave to the professionals of psychiatry. I go and, you know, on the line of that, like, but what I'm allowed by law mm. uh, and uh, and I learn a lot from, I have colleagues who are clinical psychologists and also clinical or, uh, psych, psychiatrists. I have a psychiatrist, but one of my, my, my uh, of the men that I, I have, a, I, I, do, I do process, personal process with, like therapy, he has a psychiatrist. And I work together, like partnership, partnership with the psychiatrist to help this person. So we are actually, you know, working together. So I'm, uh, let's say, um, I, I, I do, I do it. Uh, I, I enjoy all of the, all, all of the words. I'm not concentrating on one classical way. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And when I said I didn't care, what I mean is like the titles, because a lot of people get obsessed with, do you have a PhD? Is there a title? But your testament to that is that if you do your own independent research, we have the internet nowadays, thankfully, you can become very effective at helping people in these ways. Uh, now, tying that into sort of Krav Maga self-defense martial arts, again, that sort of stigma of Krav Maga is just killing, punching, kicking. You know, early on, I, I had some former uh, colleagues that trained with me and I started integrating into teaching, my teaching methodology, psychology and, and the mental state of the mindset. Uh, the, the model I like to use uh, in my teaching is the Jeff Cooper mental model of uh, white, yellow, orange, red, and then the Marine Corps added black because I find it actually really encompasses your mind and nervous system during a fight, but also the same model can be used at home or in day-to-day -day practice. Like, do I feel like I'm in a fight nervous system-wise, even if I'm not? Because, you know, as you said, the brain doesn't always know the difference. And I found 
I, uh, my other colleagues who had only been upbringing in that traditional Krav Maga, like fight, punch, kick, kill each other, they they didn't like it. And I noticed that there's some instructors like you or other instructors are like, hey, we need to update how we're teaching to include this combat psychology and mental state. And then there's others who don't want to. And, and maybe one of the reasons I, I'm just thinking is that People see Kramaga as practical, no, no philosophy, no cra uh, tradition, no martial, like a traditional martial arts, and they and they don't like. They think it's a waste of time. But as you and I know, know that understanding your mind is just as important. So, how have you integrated that, or how is the challenge of going from that traditional into including combat psychology into your teachings? How how has that process been? It was really uh, interesting because uh, the way I learned Krav Maga was uh, not a lot of talking on psychology. Like, for example, in the unit, we just train Krav Maga, but we don't talk on Krav Maga too much. Like, we are doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, vice versa, talking about the psychological part of fighting was um, a little bit, you know, addressed as a weakness a bit you know we just do it just do it we don't talk too much why does it work because i kicked you it works shut up <laughs> <laughs> so uh i uh i was always because of my instructional experience i was trying to you know go behind the scenes all the time of the movement of the technique of why this technique will work and why this technique would work in the um, I decided to incorporate myself in the unit already a lot of psychology. And in instinct, I, I actually put it as a definition, like a, as, a, as a defining part of the organization. We teach psychology, we teach combat psychology, and, and, and we have to do it because Krav Maga is psychology. Krav Maga is not jab, cross, uh, knife defense. Krav hmm. Maga is first of all winning your mind, and the external simple circumstances are the result of what you did in your mind before. So, it's a it's a critical part to understand. People training Krav Maga all day long, and they go on the street, and they have a freezing mode, and they're not able to fight. Why? Because they're practicing all day long, physically, and not addressing the most important part, which is the psychology part. And during my seminars, they end, uh, they end up, you know, exhausted physically, but also mentally, <laughs> because we talk a lot. We talk a lot, and sometimes with, you know, with your air, when you don't have air, sometimes relaxed, but we talk a lot. I have, every seminar, we have a lecture. During the seminar, after one break, well, it's one of the seminars that I give. Uh, I, go, I do a lecture. And this is something that is, I think, crucial to the understanding. And in the lecture, we talk about a lot of stuff, including the freezing mode. And we then practice the freezing mode, which this is what I think we should practice, by the way. Because that differentiate between the black zone, white zone, and the gray zone. And the black zone is when you fight. The white zone is when you are friend with someone, but the, the, the gray zone is whether it, you're not sure where it's going to, it's going to be a fight or not. You know, someone, for example, looked at you in a wrong way, in an aggressive way, or attacked at you in the club. This is the gray zone. And unfortunately, we are not dealing with that too much in the Kromaga community. I encourage all my, our colleagues, to give our students a better opportunity to face the, the freezing mode. Mm -hmm. Everybody is a hero when the instructor says, three, two, one, go, yeah, and then, bam, bam, protect, okay, I'm good. But will you really do that on the street? We don't know. We still don't know. We need to get to know you. And how do I get to know you? We need to talk a bit in the mm -hmm. seminar. Instru Krav Maga instructors are a little bit afraid to speak because they speak like this is Krav Maga, let's go, let's go. But actually, a, Krav Maga, a good Krav Maga instructor should have, should have I would say, uh, 
it should be also a professional in, in psychology. Mm. In the instructor schools, you have to teach the, if you are qualifying instructors, you need to teach them the psychology part of Krav Maga and to teach them how to teach the psychology part of Krav Maga because you know who are who are our students, Jonathan? Your students, I will, they're not the biggest, you know, strongest people on earth. They're not, they're not the most successful in dealing with people on the street. Physically, even they're not, maybe not healthy. Maybe they're a little bit fat. Maybe they have some sickness. There's low self-esteem. This is why they come to train Krav Maga. And if you think that you're going to solve their problem only through the techniques, then you're wrong. You need to understand what is the problem. Maybe, maybe he has an obsession. Maybe he has OCD. Yeah. Maybe he has OCD in his life. And then we'll take the OCD into the Krav Maga training. And it looks like this. You tell him to strike, to strike with the first two knuckles, and by mistake he will do the five, and then he will feel so bad that he will, after the class, he will stay and give 500 punches more to train on that. He will break them mm. because it's obsessive compulsive disorder that he took from another part of his life. And you thought that it's good because. He need to know the technique, but you didn't understand that there is something deeper in his mind. You need to be a psychologist, and a psychologist, psychologist in that moment. So I encourage us all to elaborate ourselves on psychology in order to become better Krav Maga instructors. Hmm. Yeah, that's I, I certainly agree with it. I, I started I studied psychology to 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 learn about myself and then maybe help people. I ended up just leaving and finishing with an associate's degree because I can't deal with that environment anymore. But that's a different story. <laughs> um uh and it just you know you're right is and, and it's a lot of instructors regardless of uh style a lot of instructors they end up being whether they like it or not like a counselor or or whatever and it's it's a difficult role because you need to keep sort of that role separate you you can't always become friends with all your students because it gets it gets inappropriate sometimes male or female they, people get you know with psychological issues they get weird attachments to to authority figures and it's like you have to make that sort of effort to to counsel them as you can as well as teaching them it's an interesting dynamic and it's it's very difficult for a lot of people you know a lot of uh, martial arts trainers in general are just like nope i don't talk i punch and they're a phenomenal right phenomenal fighters but then it comes to running a school or or teaching and it's just not the best and and they think they're the best or their students think they're the best because they're so amazing as a, a combative person but it doesn't always translate very well and, and you have to develop that for 100 percent that's interesting that um uh, that means that you have a lot of experience in running a school then yeah I, 10 years or 2012 lots of lots of mistakes lots of screw-ups working through my own personal emotional problems uh it uh it's been quite quite the challenge and, and ironically uh not that i was expecting to i got married recently and that seems to have grounded me a little bit so that i have that yeah I, it's it's stable as someone with mental health problems it's given me a stability in my life that I was lacking. And I feel like I've been that stability resolving my own problems has actually made me a better teacher Un, like unrelated. <clears throat> so it's it's that journey. It's just uh, always even if you screw up constantly, which I did <laughs> trying to be a little bit better, you know, your ability, your honesty is highly appreciated. You know, yeah, I try. Yeah. Krav Maga instructors are trying to to uh, sustain uh, to, to to project a strong uh, image, an un unbreakable image. Yeah, and you're doing yeah. the opposite here, and I think this is exactly what could. And I'm sure that your students are are uh, getting a lot of value from that. That you are able to convey your feelings and your your, as you said, depression or whatever. And this is 
highly appreciated. And mm. I think that a breakthrough in your instruction on career because you are when you confess on such things, then your students are doing as well. And so I, I encourage you know, to do that. And uh, myself, hey. I do that. As well. I talk about my fears, my anxieties, and and my all obsessions, and and. Of course, how to overcome, and there is a way to clean anxiety. You can do that. You can just invest and do that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I started this podcast as an example uh, many years ago, very early in the days of podcast. You know, just throw it out on the internet, and th and then I stopped due to instability in my life. But then I started it again during the pandemic when we were locked down and my students couldn't train, and I wanted to connect again with the people and reach out to people because you know people were losing their minds <laughs> and they needed to hear hear something and, and get something when they couldn't do anything uh, if that makes sense and i'm happy i started it again because i like talking as a good jew talk and <laughs> discuss and debate <laughs> just like you getting your, your legal degree <laughs> instructor your instructor in yeah <laughs> yeah now i i did have a question because this is I still struggle is how do you replicate that freeze training in class? Cause my, and just my observationally, uh, it's a story I tell. So my listeners are probably tired of it is that when I was in the military, you know, a miserable experience for me too, but it was, and we did an exercise once where, uh, they took away the food for three or four days and they kept telling everyone, Hey, you guys are getting food. You guys are getting food and we're not sleeping, and we're physically exhausted. And then you started to see the mental breakdown of the Spitzim, the people who are supposed to be the best. They keep getting promoted up because they do what they're told, and they're likable. And I noticed that they fell apart, a lot of them, not all of them, but a large percentage of them. And then just in personal experience, I have another story. Uh, I went on this lake once to rescue one of our boats had been uh, washed away. And I, by the way, I'm terrified of water. I hate water. I don't. I can swim, but I don't like to swim. And I'm like, we need to get this boat, or we're stranded here. And I, I said, who else has got the experience in, on the water? I don't have any experience. Just uh, too much confidence. And we went out, and the waves are like huge in these dinky little boats, and it was getting extremely challenging. And I noticed the the guy who came out with me is a big, strong guy, just couldn't handle it. And started to break down to the point where I'm like, this is actually a very dangerous situation. If you start panicking, like we have a serious problem. And I had to just not, like figure this out in the fly. And what I tell my students is, and, and for, I can teach you all I want. I, unfortunately, you will not know how you're going to react under these extreme stresses until you have to. And trying to make students realize that or the freeze is i'm still not sure how to approach it so how do you approach it in, in specifically maybe in both the physical training and the mental aspect of it <clears throat> well first i first break it down um into the mental aspect i explain how the brain works during the freezing mode i i actually explained that deeply and um, once that, but that, that is done, then we move, move to training. So we have a lot of simula simulations that um, even though it's training, you're still in shock. <laughs> so a lot of ways, you know, uh, by a lot of pushing, slapping, let's say closing eyes, you know, it's not things that you're not aware of, but uh, there's specific ways that I'm doing that. I have some videos that I, I think are online. You can check it out mm. um, and remaining there not, not not really moving to the other phase immediately not not telling him okay uh, he's pushing you and then you strike no i want you to remain there i want you to be in shock i want you to feel bad i want you to to, to... and also verbal simulations like i want you to talk to him mm. bad words curse him humiliate him sometimes you know he's of course in with some kind of a respect that you can remain but still do that and um and then i give the solutions i give a lot of solutions there are solutions physical solutions 
and mental solutions. And so I think the idea is first to approach it uh, by uh, talking, like uh, explaining it during a lecture or something like that. You know, I put them on the ground, I just they sit and then I talk and I take the time and I explain the mechanism. And then we move to training. It's not like, you know, by the way, there is a, there is a freezing mode and it's important it's important let's train let's train no I'm, I'm doing a big let's say a big deal out of it because as i said i think this is what we need to put the weight on the freezing mode because you know take the average person on the streets once it's a fight probably he will like there, there is a fight but why would he freeze because you know during the fight will fight but during but one second before the fight it would freeze and I don't want him to freeze. I want him to react and initiate, maybe initiate a strike or initiate an escape. And I want you maybe to stay there to mm -hmm. negotiate. Because the fight itself is not something that I'm too bothered of. I'm bothered from the freezing mode. What happens before, one second before, how you deal with that, okay? Yeah, makes sense. Now you, you said negotiate at the end. The using uh, so i'm from canada and uh we grew up up until recently we're very nice polite people who don't want to offend anyone but uh i am not like that uh, as a person but uh that you know the de-escalation aspect of self-defense is is almost one of the hardest things to teach you can tell i tell you you know de-escalate use your words but then i'll say listen i am terrible with my words in fact most of the time i antagonize the person without realizing it and then i have to be like oh shit i need to calm it down again um why but you're, you're a nice guy what are you talking yeah. about uh well as i said mental health problems when i was younger i had very explosive reactions to things very aggressive now it it saved me as i said because people even if i people knew i couldn't fight they're like that's the guy who might stab me and it's not true but i gave off that image you know so it did it did save me and i tell people like listen for me i i play the quote crazy card and it works for me because it's believable because my face changes my voice changes you cannot play that crazy card if I don't believe that you're going to do it. So the de-escalation, the words, you know, use your talking voice, as the Canadians would say. When the reality about the de-escalation, it's I have met very few people, even trained, that are actually so good at that that they can calm anyone down. And it's a skill on its own that is so rare. So how do you integrate teaching people to de-escalate, even though it's like the most impossible skill on the planet, if you know. <clears throat> well, I'm afraid that uh, this skill, the average person who goes twice a week to a Krav Maga class, I'm afraid that this is not enough hmm. because you need to transform your, your whole character in order to respond correctly. You can learn it in Krav Maga, but if you're an angry person in your life in general, then I don't believe that the Krav Maga training itself would, would be enough. I suggest that you will incorporate some, going through some mental process of controlling your anger, of using your fear correctly. Go and get a course, go to a workshop. Mm. Now, my abilities in, as a Krav Maga, let's say, practitioner, as a fighter, let's say, are not because I'm, I have good technical skills. It's not the reason. The reason is that, well, it's part of the reason, but another reason is that I invested a lot in myself, on my character, and I still do, and, um, in, you know, controlling your fear, controlling your anger, your jealousy, your solving your, your obsessions, your obsessive circuits in your mind. And this is, uh, this is a good fighter when you're investing in yourself, not, on, not only in the Krav Maga class. You see great Krav Maga fighters who take them on the street. As you said, the vibration they project is so, so aggressive that they are provoking fights. Mm. And your best fight is the one you prevent. 
What did? What have you done? Mm. Yeah. Your best fight is the one you, you you prevent, and you don't want to fight. And because you didn't, and you relied on your Krav Maga training, and you trusted it as if it's the the magic, then it's not enough. You need to go on and invest yourself in other territories. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. That's uh, it's a challenge for many students because they, you know, I can barely find the time to come to class and then I got my family and then I got my school. School p Students love to use school. Uh, you know what I tell the students all the time? I'm like, uh, are you aware of all the research that shows that if you get enough sleep and you exercise, you will probably be do better in school and studying that extra 10 hours will probably make it worse for you. <laughs> and they just look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's 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 hard to 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 convince people to change all habits of life, mm. but this is where our this is our role is to uh, you see this is a podcast on Krav Maga, right? But oh, uh, on anything, but we you can honestly you can talk about anything. My guests are used I, to me talking about anything. <laughs> this is, this is the beauty of your podcast because mm. it's not a Krav Maga, classic Krav Maga podcast. I would say we're talking about the whole atmosphere of Krav Maga and, and, and in order to be a good fighter, you have to invest in we I encourage you guys, listeners, don't rely on your training. This is not enough. Twice a week, it's not enough. Go to see a mentor, go to see a coach, go to take a course all the time, all the time, be in the movement and... and uh, so it, it goes, there's a harmony. If you invest in, in you invest in your Krav Maga training, then you're solving one substantial part of your life, the fighting part, as we discussed earlier. But then if you're solving, let's say, your obsessions, you have a lot of obsessions. You have smoking obsessions. You have drug obsessions. You have smartphone obsession. You have porn and masturbation obsession. Then you're solving those obsessions Guess what? It reflects on Krav Maga dramatically. Mm -hmm. Dramatically. And uh, for example, I'm going to soon post and publish a video um, on, a, on an online lecture that I gave and they asked me a question and we spoke about the, 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 the implication of sperm ejaculation and sperm retention and masturbation on Krav Maga. So I'm not going to open it right now uh, because this is I'm, I'm going to do a whole different video about it. Mm. There you there you see you have to solve a lot of let's say satellite subjects in order to influence your Krav Maga. Everything is connected. So if we take it to the brain structure, you have the prefrontal cortex, which is the front. This is, this is the part of the head, and the back of the head is responsible. This is more the subconscious part. This is the, the, the logical, the intelligent, the thinking to the future, the, the, the wisdom. This is the prefrontal cortex, but the back of the brain, the subconscious, the back part of the brain are responsible for anxieties, for your beliefs, for your obsessions. And you can see a person who goes, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz. Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz is the Albert Einstein of our generation of their brain research. Mm. So we proved in fMRI scans that people who have more activity in the prefrontal cortex are more successful people in their life, in their family, in their work, in their health, everything, as opposed to the people who have more electric activity in the back part of the brain, the amygdala and the, and the some parts that we have over there, I need to translate it. Yeah, I, yeah. I know it in Hebrew, but better than in English. Mm. Uh, in the English course on OCD, there everything is English, and uh, we'll talk about it later. So, the more brain activity in the back of the brain, it means that you have more failures in your life, obsessions, broken relationships, um, abusing behaviors, all of that, less money bad jobs, etc. cetera, it, you can actually see and recognize by brain structures. And we know in the process of, for example, that I do to people that um, there are certain 
drills that you can do that activates a lot of activity in the prefrontal cortex and you change your brain structure physically without fears with drills with mental drills it's uh, you need to invest and learn but still it's drills that you can make like krav maga drills and if you solve those areas and you do those drills it, it influences your krav maga ability mm. so everything is connected i encourage to invest everything in yourself yeah a hundred percent. It's like, uh, so the, the prefrontal cortex was the, for those who don't know, the, the latest uh, part of the brain to develop. Uh, it's associated with stable intelligence. Not always, but a lot of the times larger prefrontal cortex like dolphins or something will have higher cognitive capabilities. It's m more associated with sort of your conscious waking mind, while as the, the amygdala and the, the like amdula ablagata, if you ever saw the movie, Adam Sandler movie, Water Boy, <laughs> uh, it's the more primal animalistic part of your brain. And I, I like to use the analogy. Have you ever read the book uh, uh, Dune by Frank Herbert? No. Uh, yeah, old book. Uh, it's, it's like one of the best science fiction books of all time. And I use this example all the time because it really is on this point is there's this sect of uh, uh, religious, I guess, zealots who believe in controlling your mind and body and genetic manipulation through through procreation, the Bene Gesserit. And they have this test where they'll take your hand and they put it in this box. Now, they they don't he doesn't really explain. But the basic premise is that you know that you're putting your hand in this box and your hand is fine. But what the box does is it creates immense excruciating pain because it stimulates the nerve, but you know there's no damage. So the test is, in their perspective, is are you a human or are you an animal? Because an animal will revert to the, the primal part of their brain, panic, pull it out, try to cut their hand off, but the, the human will use their prefrontal cortex to say, I know nothing is actually wrong. And what they're trying to get, they're trying to see who's mentally strong and can override the, the baser instincts, which are there for a legitimate reason of, of survival. <clears throat> and I think that's maybe where, you know, self-defense and psychology all comes in. It's like, listen, we are, need to use this front part of our brain more. Uh, it's also why people who have a lot of head trauma, particularly the front part of the brain, are more aggressive. I think it's just genetic for me. Uh, I didn't get hit that much. <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's just fascinating the why. Now, you know, as we were joking before the in the Krav Maga world, it's like, why does it work? Because I kicked you and you said, ow, shut up. But it's like almost the Israeli methodology is so brilliant yet so... I want to say ignorant, for lack of a better word, because through lack of resources, time and money, Israelis had to figure everything out really quickly. And they found the solution of training methodology that's amazing, but they can never explain the why. And now we're kind of in this position where it's like, OK, we know it works, but why? And we're like reverse engineering it back through understanding the psychological processes and uh, and which unfortunately means half let's say the good instructors i uh, guess i'm there's a lot of bad instructors out there half of them probably are like i just spent 20 years learning something i don't want to relearn new new stuff and they don't want to learn to re-explain the why which is a pain in the ass for everyone uh which is why side note i have an issue with the trusty experts because sometimes people who spent their whole lives doing something don't want to change when a new piece of information comes along I would say we're kind of in that revolution in the Krav Maga world because there's a lot of people who want to integrate this stuff and then there's a lot of people who are like, I, I'm not doing that, if if any of that makes sense to you. That's a, a very important, let's say, message to instructors today that the people, the instructors who will stuck, will stick to their ideas will be back in the past and they will be extincted. And you can see that. You can actually see that, you know, they're less popular, they're less 
let's say, uh, have less students because of that, because they're stuck. And the world is now growing up. We cannot no longer rely on things that are prehistorical in Krav Maga. Mm. And you need to always evolve. And I can tell you that I'm willing to hand over, to throw the thing. This is you know, the curriculum of instincts. Yeah, I'm willing to take it, tear it apart and throw it to the garbage one day if I found that it's the, the right thing to do. Mm. Like we need to disattach from the emotional part, from the disattach emotionally from the technique <laughs> and from the legacy of my older instructor who was the creator of the whatever, Krav Maga in Israel or in, in Canada. Like, mm. this is so, no, no, so not rational. And we need to represent rationalism because in Krav Maga, you have to disattached from stimulation to, to, to create a distance between stimulation and reaction. This is the art of Krav Maga. If someone pushes me, I'm not necessarily need to take a chair and break his head. Maybe I want to wait. Maybe I'm going to say, okay. And then I'm just going to go call the police. Yeah. Maybe I don't have a chair. We need to, dis to, to, to take a distance from the stimulation that you're experiencing to the reaction that you're reacting. This is Krav Maga. And prefront the concept, by the way, we, the people who have like a stronger muscle there, let's say more activity, they're able to create a distance. And instructors, we need to also create a distance. Mm. Means that you can just tell yourself that this is this technique proven wrong and I want to change it. And in instinct, for example, I've changed techniques throughout the years. I did that. Mm. And we should all do that all the time. Yeah. Don't no, I I, I I did that. I went through that process. I'm still uh, working on my instructor program, it's a lifelong progress that I wanted to be something amazing with theory and practice and stuff. But I remember when in the early days, like I started with one of the big organizations, very well known, I'm not, I won't say. And I, I looked at their curriculum and they had like 2000 techniques or 1300 or whatever the number. And I'm like, nobody can remember this. And I started when there was a an understanding that that organization didn't care about Canada and we're, we're not sending people there. We don't want to develop people there. You have to go to the States or come to Israel, which I can't afford to do this all the time, guys. Uh, it was like, okay, let's see who's teaching in North America uh, in, that is accessible to me. And I start, whether they were good or bad for me, you start exploring the other organizations and also me picking up uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and, and dabbling in other stuff. And you know, I started realizing, you know, we need to change the curriculum. And I remember <clears throat> I had a batch of instructors I produced. And one of the is good guy, just hothead, grew up in a rough neighborhood. Uh, you know, he had the idea. I need he hit psychological issues. Obviously, he's trying to like, you don't know, he like gang neighborhood, let's say. And he's like, you don't understand what violence is. And he's trying to teach Canadians. And Vancouver is a very safe city. So people have a, a bit of a disconnect sometimes here. And I changed the curriculum and he got really angry at me. It's like, I just spent all this time learning it and you want me to relearn it? And I was like, yes. And I was, I was almost at the point of having to boot him from my school. He left uh, for his own personal reasons anyway. But it was like, I realized at that moment, like one of the most in important instructor qualities that I want, as much as I'd love everyone to be the best practitioner and the best, it's are you willing to learn new stuff? Because if you're not willing to do that, for me, it's like going to be a headache for me. And then even if you represent my brand, if I need a major update and you refuse, uh, you're not really teaching what I w my organization would, would like it to anymore. And it's I haven't, I'm not huge or anything. I don't have any affiliate schools, but I'm thinking about it. So on the note of instructors... How do you approach that in your organization? Because it's there's a an issue in the Krav Maga world. I think about quality control and how to approach it, and how long courses should be, and 
because uh, I think running a, a really good instructor program is a lot of work and follow up and a, a lot of people don't want to do that. So how, how do you approach the instructor aspect? You mean that qualification of instructor? Yeah, sure. Or... How, what's your, for instinct or in general uh, for this, for this topic? Well, like the instructor's course has a very, no. Uh, experienced format already mm. that it's always it's, we evolve the the format of the qualification and um, I would say that we we teach the techniques like they need to know the techniques very well on the on at the same time I tell them if you find a technique that is better I want you to show that you think is better show me let's examine it and so they have their, well, till today, um, maybe once I received such a request, I believe because I'm really criticized, I, I, I am my best criticizer. Like I'm always criticizing myself. And the team here in Israel, we always discuss and, and, and check what improvement we can make. But when we get some kind of a comment, then we seriously examine, I love it because I want to learn. And uh, so I tell them, this is the technique, but if you, you will do, instead of 45 angle, you will do 70, 70 uh, uh, degrees angle, then it's okay. I know that there are curriculums and in the, in the test, the examiner will test and say, no, the, the, the angle is 45. <laughs> yeah, but he took control of the, of the attacker. Why do you care? Like, it's okay, that's enough. Don't make a deal out of it. As long as it was not like some a bizarre movement that he made, that made him lose a lot of time. And I will tell you again another thing. If he did something and it was a good improvision, then good. It means that he's a good fighter. I don't want to fixate his brain and tell him, you have to do this technique. This is not a Bible. So the technique I would say is the Heads up, this is a good term to say, heads up. Like direction, this is the direction, the technique is the direction you need to go. Mm. But the principle behind the technique is more important. Yeah. I want, I put emphasis on the principle, less on the technique. Like we have specific techniques and we do a lot of demonstrations, but we really examine the principle. And if you did a mistake in the principle, then I will might fail in the exam. Mm. because it doesn't understand the movement yeah it's the uh it's first principle approach right? elon musk was going off about e first principle it's like the basics of uh of the structure uh, do you know who uh john danaher is by any chance john what john danaher is a jiu-jitsu coach i think i heard it yeah, yeah look into him because they say this guy is uh he used to be, I think, a new NYU philosophy professor. So, so the guy is a, a brilliant human being. Wow. Uh, but he got into martial arts. He's a Henzo Gracie uh, black belt. Uh, he is responsible for coaching uh, George St. Pierre, the famous Canadian MMA fighter. He's responsible for producing uh, Gordon Ryan, who right now is pound for pound the number one grappler on the planet, like without question. He's like 50 wins in a row against the best people in the world because he's so successful because he approaches things from a first principle. So an example was he looked in the jiu-jitsu world and MMA and he said, okay, if I take a look at all of the submissions that are out there, what's the top 10 list of submissions? And he said, okay, I'm going to take the top five or maybe six. And that's what I'm going to focus my curriculum on because even if the other stuff can work, probability says it won't work and so he focuses on what works and focuses their time and drilling on that uh, another thing that he said was he wants his guys to learn especially beginners i want you to get comfortable in the worst positions uh, so for example being on bottom side control or being under under someone's mount in their mount uh, the reason is there's a common sports psychology, and I've, I've run into this personally, where 
you are so concerned about the points or so concerned about not losing that you don't try to win. And then by making people comfortable with the worst positions and drilling it, these people get so confident in their ability to get out of these positions that they will try to win the fight with a riskier submission without concern, oh, I might lose the fight. And as a result, he's produced people like Gordon Ryan and George St. Pierre and these amazing elite winners. It, he's not teaching anyone anything that people don't know already around the world. It's just that first principle approach. This is what works. Here's the psychology, the sports psychology of it. Uh, he incorporates physics as well, uh, levers, wedges, uh, alignment and stuff as well as why a technique is from an a human engineering perspective more efficient than not. And I, I was introduced to this sort of concept. A couple instructors, uh, and I it just shifted how I taught because I'm like, the principles matter because even if we get to that freeze mentality, if you're like, I my instructor hasn't taught me this technique yet, well, you're going to get punched in the face now versus... Well, what is the, the strategic principle to apply here? I, I don't know what to do. An example, one thing I teach is if you have no idea what's going on and you can't run, just find a way to hit the groin or get at the eyes as just do it. And and so because, you know, the curriculum, even though even if you have a small curriculum, that freeze, that panic, it's like, I, I don't want to do. But if that principle of groin eyes, groin eyes, just just get at them, kicks in, they'll figure out a way. Uh, to to fight through it, if that makes sense. <clears throat> You're right. The principle and the interesting story about this man, this person, yeah. and uh, this is what we should focus on: principles, not only techniques. And uh, the the if you have, for example, uh, as I said during an exam, or don't I, I want him to 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 feel. Freedom, the student to feel freedom to move interestingly in, in other ways, not creating OCDs on certain movements. Okay, I want him to not eliminate his instincts. Because another mistake that we're dealing with in Brahmaga is trying to eliminate instincts mm -hmm. to changing the instinct. And when you're trying to change an instinct, it doesn't work. If you're trying to learn a new movement, then you repeat it 10,000 times, for example, okay? You repeat and then you will do it good. But an instinct you cannot change. An instinct you cannot change. If I'm going to surprise you, the instinct will take over and win. And so I don't want to change the instincts. I want to, to recognize, to put a title in it and walk with it. So a lot, a lot of work that we do in, in instinct is trying to investigate what are the instincts mm. for every single technique. Attack, sorry. For every single attack, what is the instinct? How the instinct of the human of an average person will react? And we take the instinct and we walk with it. Like obsessively, we believe in the, I believe in the nature, I believe in your simplicity, and I don't want you to, because sometimes the person will come to you to three months training, right? Only three months you, ha you have with him. What are you going to do now? Try to change his instincts? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why, like, I, I'm honest with people when they walk in the door. I'm like, everyone thinks they're going to cut the, how long till I get my black belt? I'm like, eh, <laughs> you won't be here in six months. I, I don't tell them that, but that's the reality of martial arts in yeah. general. And, uh, I do focus on the principles with the beginning students because I assume, uh, statistically, they're not going to be around. And to develop the physical skill set, because as you said earlier, you know, I'm we're dealing with middle-aged women, uh, parents, uh, young teens with mobility issues, whatever. Uh, the whole world thinks we're always training. The the well for Israel, for example, right? They literally pick or streamline from high school, if they are able to, the top percentage of physical and cognitively capable people in the country towards the top units. It's, it's, a, it's a luxury that most countries don't have and would explains why 
uh, Israeli special forces are so good compared to other places is because you literally pick the best people in the country. In other countries, they get who they get, and then they have to pick the best people of those people. And so it creates this illusion that that's who we're teaching to when really you're not. You cannot take the top 1% athlete and, and get used to training them and then go take that exact same method and go teach soccer moms. It doesn't work. Uh, and and less and less uh, it's it's becoming less of a problem but that's just how i think internationally kramaga was approached for so long uh, versus the other sort of side the north american i call it the american kramaga where they turned it into a kickboxing class and i'm like that's missing the point because it's lacking the principles uh in the end because if i only have you for six months i need you to understand the principles that will translate to decision making because you're not going to stay here for five years, most likely, to develop the 10,000 hour rule, uh, if that makes sense. But then, let me tell you something, like uh, surprisingly, <clears throat> from what I saw in uh, gyms, in Kramaga gyms in the US, mm. you know, Americans, they know how to do stuff. Like they're, let's say, industrial. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's, I want to focus on the positive part of that. Mm. Because the yeah, of course, it's hurting a bit the professionalism and the truth of of, of the street. But at the same time, uh, as you mentioned, they turn it into some kickbox training. Uh, this apparently, as you can see, this attracts a lot of people. You see, so I'm as a father would say. Like if I'm a father of uh, in the Krav Maga world, I would say I'm happy. Like I I like the idea that I don't care how you bring people in, how you attract them to stay. And you can see because they have thousand techniques in the curriculum and thousand grades. Okay, this is an interest. It's it's an organization organizational decision to bring more people and to have them. And I I. In instinct, for example, we have eight grades, which is mm. not a lot. But still, I don't think that like they have an important role. Let's say the industrial gyms, that they have like kickbox craft maga, whatever. This brings people, and as long as they remain there and they train, it's better than they will go to a club, then then they will go to let's say uh, some other time to that only to the gym they go to the gym so instead of going to the gym they're going to a Krav Maga kickbox class mm. like i think that we need to appreciate I, I i saw that in la i was in a gym in another very big gym in los angeles of a very famous Krav Maga organization mm. one of the biggest um and i agree with you about the industrial on the professional side but at the same time i saw so many people and they're training and they're amused and they're having fun and society and they know have social social circles over there and this pushes Krav Maga more and more and and and, and I, I think that they're an important part as well and we need we need to appreciate them also a lot yeah no I mean that totally makes sense from a human factor getting people active and moving is always a great thing I wonder though in the states specifically because yeah, I've been to some gyms in in the big cities in America where they have like a thousand students. Which for a, if a if a Vancouver gym has a thousand students, it's like give me that magic. It's like, but it's also to do with you know population density uh, in in the U.S. because it's so many people. Like L.A., it's like there's too yeah. many people there, or New York, there's too many people there. But also. Because I exp I have some friends, they are in. A, uh, I'll just keep it vague. Uh, they were in a, a fairly large state in one of the smaller cities, but it's still big. It's like a million people. There was one Kramaga gym uh, in this place, and it was more of a you know kickboxing. I mean, it's aggressive, but it wasn't what people would consider a good good Kramaga. And there were some other issues, like they were certifying people with criminal records as instructors. And uh, the colleague of mine, who's a police officer, and started exploring the Krav Maga world, was like, "I don't like this." They ended up opening their own gym, and guess what? They're more successful now because 
you know, there's law enforcement involved in the program and they've explored Krav Maga and uh, they know other aspects of combat and people start to see like, oh, that looks a lot better. So it's almost in the States is that people just don't know what it should look like. Again, it's amazing, more active. Like I think martial arts of any kind should be in all elementary schools and mm -hmm. all high schools, end of story, whatever. Even if I make fun of Taekwondo, I'd rather them be doing that than not, right? Um, uh, it's it's And that's one of my goals of this podcast, though, is to sort of hopefully inform the global world what, forget Krav Maga, what good self-defense looks like because there's a lot of even good martial arts martial martial artists out there selling stuff that is good martial arts but not necessarily good krav maga because maybe they're not talking about the principles or the psychology or they can do it because they're a world champion but that soccer mom cannot do it so it's not so great uh if that makes sense to you yeah <clears throat> yeah now uh you mentioned uh, you have eight ranks because I'm always curious how people approach this. Uh, how does the ranking work in your organization? We have, uh, if someone uh, like we have eight, eight grades, and so you know, we, there's a certain time, and before you get, you can uh, get examined to the next grade, mm. like every other organization. And uh, for example, from the moment you begin. The moment you take the first grade, three months, mm -hmm. then again three months, the next six months, and then nine months. So it's it's basically getting it's a, it's it's a, a larger time, longer time between the, the, the higher the grade you are, the long the, the longer you need to wait, mm -hmm. and um, and every grade has its own curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty standard. It makes sense. Yeah, like... standard. Not, not something. Uh, I would say that. Uh, the um, in the curriculum we put an, an emphasis on the simplicity it means for example the the the, the knife threat defense is based on on same principles and even movements like such as uh pistol defense pistol mm. threat defense like we're trying to to make a lot of uh, parallel lines between mm. different techniques yeah you mentioned before because the average mom she doesn't have the time to be proficient and to remember this angle and if he is approaching uh, uh, on the front from the side from the back i, I cannot really teach so i I'm, I'm teaching a principal movement that will apply to as many cases as possible hmm. so the curriculum is putting a lot of emphasis on that yeah no that makes sense. i do that too as well it's uh, i think I haven't checked. I'm still kind of tweaking my advanced curriculum, but I think I have like 300 total things I teach. And, and my advanced curriculum, uh, Green Belt Plus, because I just stuck with the original judo ranking, uh, is police application, military arrests. So it's basically like white to orange is your fundamental basic self-defense that most people need. And then I start teaching the professional application, the, the cool stuff that everyone wants to learn. But if you can't punch, I'm not teaching you how to use a gun, basically. Uh, and then, you know, I am in Canada, so guns are not, we're allowed to have them, but you cannot be walking around with them here. You cannot use them for self-defense. You know, so I'll tell people, hey, but what about like an active shooter? You, you This delusion that people have that you're going to be the hero, take the gun away, and you don't know how to use the gun, which is it's mm -hmm. a problem I notice in a lot of Krav Maga outside of Israel where they don't have guns in the country. They're teaching these gun disarms, and they have no concept of how a gun works. So how are you going to take it away? Well, what if his friend comes around the corner and it wasn't a lone you know, shooter, you know? You're addressing an important issue, which um, I... I I, 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 we, we solved it in the curriculum in instinct, mm. uh, at least. That, um, yeah, we said, if a beginner is coming to you, yeah, and then you see that on the curriculum, the knife defense is all, only when he's doing after like three exams. Mm. After mm. only one year beginning the knife defense, for example, or other technique, because the advanced curriculum is safe for the advanced people, right? Mm. But we did is, for example, we have knife system. We have a lot of system and we rank the level of the, of the defense 
and we relate it to the relevant level. For, and, and this means that practitioner, in the curriculum of the practitioner, there's already knife. Mm. There's already stuff that's considered advanced, but we will offer him the, 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 only the, the, the basic part of the knife defense system. You know, so you have uh, knife, knife uh, stabbing from the front and upper and overhead and slices and thread from the front and thread from the rear and thread on the chest. So a lot of, so we put the, the we, we divide it and we want him to speak the language of knife on day one already. And speak the lang language, language of pistol on day, or day one. And speak the language of ground on day one. Like according to his, we don't want him to weigh too much. Mm. I remember when I was in the martial arts, you know, they said, yeah, when you build black belt, you will know this technique and you will know this kata. And you will know, no, give me now. I want now. Mm. And we were watching the older, the advanced students and we were jealous and we could have done it as well. Why are you waiting? Mm. So we solved it by giving them a pieces. So they already know pistol or knife in some kind of, already, already from the beginning. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean that's uh, there's there's sort of merits to teach everything early from a like a competitive. Let's take jujitsu for example. The people that withhold certain things to higher levels, their their students competitively are not as good. Versus, for example, a lot of schools will not have their uh, their students sparring jujitsu until a year in, and when they hit competition, the schools that started sparring at the start. They perform much better because they got the 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 rounds in. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to self defense, uh, I I think it's you have to as you have to be careful because you're almost protecting students from their own delusions. You know, the average male uh, can, thinks they can fight four thousand percent better than they actually can. It's a joke on the internet, and so like I integrate basic stuff at the beginning. For example, some of my pistol movements are the same as the knife. Uh, obviously, there's different because the way the gun works right. and the way the knife works, but the certain techniques I'll teach uh, are similar in their connection so that by the time they get to the gun, the move overall movements, obviously, there's mechanical differences with a gun and a gun I want it out of their hands as fast as I can. Well, as a knife, I may need to control them or something. Uh but they, it's, it's like a pyramid, the white belt curriculum. You could not skip ahead and be proficient because the fundamentals build off. It's always building off. So, you know, I'll teach basic uh, straight line attack and 360 at the at the white belt level because I have three three levels of classes uh, because practically self from a self-defense perspective, those are the most common initial attacks. And yeah. then in the novice level, I'll be, okay, we're just going to speed it up now and go full force and, and slash and yeah. hack and you figure it out. Uh, the techniques haven't changed, just the intensity of what we're doing and, and how you're approaching it. And then at the advanced level, I'm like, okay, I'm going to teach you knife fighting now because at, at a military level, you might need to know that. Or the apocalypse, you might need to know that. But at a basic level that's not self-defense from a legal perspective. So it's just adding that level on. It's like I had a student the other day who, uh, or is still a student, um, he's like his dad used to teach him like hardcore knife fighting. And I, he had, you know, there's issues with the dad like, like that. And uh, he's like, I don't want to learn the knife stuff at the beginner curriculum. And I started to teach him. He's like, oh, this is actually like self-defense because he had in his head that <laughs> knife fighting is self-defense. And I'm like, no, 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 no. So I'll reserve that for the students who've shown me you're mature enough to understand when do you actually getting in a knife fight because people watch, you know, uh, too much Hollywood. They always think they start with the knife out standing in front of each other. It's not what the YouTube video shows. So it's just... Yeah building up the more complicated situations like uh active shooter situation is complicated but simple but in the news and the media confuses people how to behave and uh you start with the simple situation build up get a little more complicated more complicated but as i said in my curriculum is like i don't know 300 overall techniques including the advanced stuff and and maybe sometimes i'll tweak it because i don't like how how it worked or 
uh, I have a uh, students I'm working on my law enforcement. I have some students who do a lot of security work at the hospitals with mental health patients, uh, mental health patients. And I'm integrating some of the stuff they do because they have a lot of real world experience uh, compared to me on a day to day basis. So it's it, that that first principle is building up thing. I think it's the future or if not already, it's a must. It's a must for curriculum development uh, rather than separating everything. I think you're, you're doing great. Like you're not what I do. And this is you're in the good direction. With that. Mm, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I, I got about 20 minutes left because I have a, a an appointment and I, I do want to use all that time because I think you have a lot of uh, good things. But is there anything in the next sort of 20 minutes that you want to talk about uh, that we have not covered yet? Uh, not something in particular. You go ahead. You have wonderful questions. Oh, that's good. Uh, well, let's talk about your book then. Uh, how does the book uh, one? Is it available in English? Or is it only Hebrew? Because I see on your Facebook, it's all Hebrew. Uh, and either way, uh, sort of how does your book tie into uh, everything you've said so far? Yeah, so the book is uh, called Unconventional Weapon, The Complete Guide for Using Fear. And this uh, came out of a lot of, let's say, clinical practice here in my clinic and also from uh, students, from my students. Uh, and I... I saw that there is a need for, because of my experience with fear, and I have a lecture, right? I have a lecture called Fear Wisely, I also have a course, a, a digital course called, called Fear Wisely, the mastering the mechanism, the most mechanism, the most important mechanism in life, the fear. And I claim that the fear is the most important mechanism that we have, that we have in life. When you walk correctly with fear, you are um, you are a winner. You can just overcome everything. You can be a monster <laughs> in everything you touch, mm. because the fear is a weapon. And if you know if you know to feel wisely, you can become use it as an unconventional weapon for success. And this is a digital course. The digital course is the equivalent to the book, by the way. Well, it's not the whole book. It's, there are some things that are elaborated in the course because it's uh, even some things I go deeper in the digital course than the, the book. So uh, if you want, the, the book is not available in, uh, in, in English. Uh, so I created the digital course, which is called Fitwise. It's on my website. And the, the we're dealing with nine, I, I was able to, to pick the nine, the most common, the nine most common fears in our lives, and to find so there's two 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 parts. First part is the ten keys of fear, which is uh, you have it in the digital course. Ten keys of fear: how to use fear, how to what is fear, how to use it. Ten methods, practical and proven methods by me and thousands of students. And then we go deeper to the nine most common fears. Fear of getting married. Fear of the... That was a big fear, by the way. Huge fear. <laughs> <laughs> All of us. All of us. Yeah. Uh, fear of the, the opinion of the environment, of you know, people from the environment. Stage fright, which is highly common. Stage fright. Fear of bacteria, like germophobia. And I claim that germophobia is responsible for many other anxieties that we face. We're not even aware of that, but there is a probability that the fear of bacteria is causing you not getting married, is causing you to um, not getting, uh, not going on on, like, on 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 a podium, like it's causing you straight fright. I explain how it works how the pathways work, and I prove it with a lot of uh, scientific uh, researches, and also my own experience and, and, and perspective. And so uh, we have also fried uh, fear of animals and insects and disgusting, disgusted, disgusting, how do you say it? Uh, disgust, disgust. Disgust from animals and insects 
and uh, fear of maga, uh, contact. Yeah, touching, yeah, close contact. contact. Yeah. And fear of violence also. Hmm. So, uh, which is really interesting because it's, you know, it's the Krav Maga part of the book. The, the book is not on Krav Maga, but there are a lot of flirts, a, a big a flirting with Krav Maga because of my obvious new connection. So, um, this is, uh, this book has created a lot of transformations in thousands of people in Israel. Mm. And also people who purchase the course, the online course, I get amazing feedback. People actually, I truly believe that every person could become a hero. And I wasn't a hero in my life until I did stuff and learned how to do it. Mm. And I can teach it. And I teach it and it's possible. You don't have to be born with it. It's not like a decree or something. You can develop it. It's like a muscle. Mm. And if you will do it, then you are, you're going to be happy because if you are not suffering from anxiety, then you're happy. You clean anxiety, you're happy. Obsession, depression, it all comes down to fear. Mm. Which fear? One fear. Fear of dying. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. We need to, to deal well, with you it. know, I, uh, I think it's even more fun, it's fundamental than that because it, it's this linked is the fear of the unknown because death is the ultimate unknown. <laughs> it's the way I look at it. And anytime like humans don't know, we freak out. Now, uh, you can approach this question however you like. Uh, we do have limited time, unfortunately. Everything you just said, I'm just thinking, and I'm looking back at the last two years, and all I see is fear at all levels. How have you approached this, this, the, the reality that people have just picked a point to stick on due to some kind of fear, whether it's fear of losing freedom on one side, fear of death on the other side, fear of looking bad in public opinion if you say the wrong thing. Like you listed everything and it's like you could do a case study of the last two years. We'll probably do it in 50 years of just how not to handle things and let fear completely overwhelm everyone. So what are your thoughts on that? I, I was done with writing the book when the Corona began. Oh, good timing. <laughs> like I had, like I, I had a lot of uh, inspiration from the Corona issue because I saw that there was like a rising of the, the Pandora boxes of the all humanity. Mm. Like all the anxieties were popping out now. Like all the things that we depressed popped out. Mm. And it's good. It's a cleanse. We're yeah. cleaning it. And I deal with that with hip, a lot of with the hypochondria. And you can see that the governments are using fear to control population. And on the other side, you can see that the fear of losing freedom is healthy. Mm. We want to fear. We want to fear in our life. We don't want to be fearless. You know, we don't want to eliminate the fear. We, want, we don't want to overcome fear. We want to use it wisely. So what is anxiety? Anxiety is uh, an excessive fear, which is characterized by an excessive, by, by like an unreasonable reaction to the circumstances. So it's an exaggerated fear, okay? And this is what we see all day long, fear, fear, fear. And this is what made me make the digital course and made me create the OCD course which is OCD is also related to fear. Fear that something is wrong if I'm not going to do this precisely. This has to be precision. OCD is precision, symmetry, uh, OCD of cleaning. A lot of, you know, the, the course is talking about, it's available if you want. Yeah, so, send me the links afterwards. I'll put it posted on everything. Yeah. So the fear is, is the master of our life. And we saw that. We saw that the world has gone nuts, completely nuts, <laughs> lost his mind. The whole world, people that you thought that are normal became insane, mm. like truly insane because they're imagining all day long, imagining, and they're willing to change the life dramatically because of their imagination. Okay. 
And only in five years from now, I, I believe that we will understand how much imagination and false thoughts the world has experienced. Hypochondria. Mm. Like the whole thing was based on a lot of hypochondria. Now I don't care whether there is a disease, is this disease in, is strong. No, it, it doesn't matter because the reaction that is not justified, never, mm. never justified. And this is why, because the humanity uh, approached this challenge not ready. Yeah. <laughs> we were Should have been ready. ready. Right? Yeah. But now yeah. we're ready because we are more experienced. But we need to get more ready because there will always be something else like mm. climate. They will give us the climate change and then they will talk about the aliens and then there will always be something. I'm not getting into the specifics, but you have to be prepared for people trying to control you and to manipulate you, maybe from correct reasons. Maybe it's real. I don't care. I'm just saying, I want you to choose. I want you to be ready, to be ready, to be ready, to be ready, to, to be ready to choose. Yeah. Well, it's like, uh, and, and I, I understand why people don't like the German Nazi comparison to this, uh, because people always jump to the Holocaust aspect. But I'm like, hey, you know, if you look at the Jews in 1930s Germany that looked around and said, I don't like the way this going, they chose to leave before it was too late. And unfortunately for the Jews that didn't, we all know who that went. And and as a Krav Maga instructor and as a Jew, and I, and I get a lot of, a lot of Jews get very angry at me when I talk about this. But I think it's important to understand you need to pay attention to the world around you beyond the punching and the king from a self-defense aspect. And, and as you said, as we saw that whether they believe they're correct or not, uh, and sometimes their starting point is reasonable, but where they end up is not. Uh, for, uh, co not Hitler, obviously, not. <laughs> but uh, uh, but COVID, like we want to save lives, great starting point. But then it gets to the point of absurdity. And I, as a self-defense instructor, and as someone who does not like to be told what to do, I'm very like toxic. Don't tell me what to do. Um, it's like I, I yeah, yeah and, and it's a challenge because you get ostracized for it, fear of social rejection. Uh, I present scientific literature. Don't care. You're not a Dr. John. Go to hell. Um, and it's just like it's so important, as you said, to understand the fear. Is it controlling you or are you making a rational decision about it? Because I, 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 you know, I do have my issues, but I try to approach it from a rational perspective. And the more you learn psychology and the more you learn how the human biology works and, and the why, you're like, wait, wait, am I just panicking and doing what they're doing because I want to fit in? And, you know, that's a, a mob mentality, for example, applies in a literal physical mob. But social situations, and I, I made the observation that it's like, this is what people are doing. Hey, are we all doing the lockdowns? Yeah, we're, we're, this is a little crazy, but we're doing it right. And if you can't, if you're just everybody, listening. Everybody yeah. does it. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's just like that fear management is so important for self-defense and being a happy human, as you said. And it's, it's because it's so primal, uh, it is difficult. And we just saw, I said, it's going to be a case study. Eventually, when all the bullshit is washed out and we really get to the bottom of what happened during the last two years, it's going to be a psychological case study of human mob mentality, behavior, and fear. I wrote uh, an article about it. Mm. The, the conclusions after two years, the conclusions on humanity after two years of, of uh, mental pandemic. This yeah. is what I wrote. Yeah. There. You, you can look it up. Uh, interesting conclusions. And um, one of the conclusions is that humanity is not, let's say, fulfilling its potential. <laughs> yeah. Not really fulfilling its brain potential, unfortunately. And uh, the fear of death is so horrible. And I'm not saying that I'm not fear of death, but I'm just saying that I have. 
I would say a better relationship with it because I walked on it and I learned how to use it correctly. And accepting that is one of the ways to cope with it, right? Mm. And, uh, uh, mastering the, the mechanism of fear is crucial in these days. This would lead humanity to a better world because a fearful man is not a nice man. When you sit around a brave person, you feel safe. Mm. And when you sit around a fearful person, you feel threatened. Not opposed, not vice versa. Is fearful from you, you will feel threatened because there's a vibration going on, right? And um, this is why I think that we need to invest in our relationship with fear and to not let this mental pandemic occur again because this is ruining the world. So if you don't want to ruin the world, save yourself, work on your relationship with fear. This is why I put all my jetons. You know what jetons is? No. Okay, I... the, casino. the casino, jetons, how do you say? I put all my eggs in one basket. Oh, all the chips, all the chips, yeah. 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 I put all my eggs in one basket and the basket is fear. Mm. When you solve fear and all is friends, his friend is anxieties, phobias, OCD, uh, panic attacks, depression, all of the fears, uh, satellite subjects, then we are going to experience a much healthier world. Mm. Oh, I, I would say so. It's uh, again, because uh, I love I love this quote. I'm just going to pull it up. Just give me one sec. Uh, it's also from the book, Dune. Uh, about managing fear. This is a book, by the way, uh, that was written in the 1960s. Um, so th this this is the the saying that they have. So it's uh, it's like a a mantra, if you will. I actually have the first line of it tattooed on my back. I got it in the while I was in the military. Funnily enough, but it goes: uh, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass uh, over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. I think it's, it's, he wrote, it's a science fiction book, but this guy was brilliant. And it's, you know, that saying that he came up with for, for the group, the Bene Gesserit, to override their primal instinct, I think it's, uh, it's very much in line with what you're what you're saying and uh, what you've written. Let me give uh, my small my, my correction, mm. which I uh, disagree. Is do not try to eliminate it. Mm. Don't try to look back and see that it's gone and that there is no no because otherwise you're gonna jump out of an airplane out of a building and you're gonna do dangerous stuff. No, we want to be same people with the healthy fear mechanism, the right dosage of fear, the right dosage of oxygen, the right of, uh, dosage of uh, food, the right uh, dosage of sex, the right dosages, dosages of water, the right dosage of fear. Do not eliminate it. And I am trying to teach what is the healthy way, the healthy dosage of fear. Yeah, uh, managing it because it is... Yeah, the way we're designed, you're not going to get rid of fear. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But uh, I think I think that's probably a good place to end. Um, any final words? You are uh, a great interviewer. Oh, thank you. It sounds like you're a great scrum against doctor. Trying to be, yeah. Thank you. Um, you have a deep yeah. respect and the whole psychology aspect of it, which is good. And, uh, I'm really, yeah. it was a really great time for me here with you. Awesome. I Thank learned you. a lot. Good, me too. I learned some stuff as well. Um, great. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? Social media, email, website? Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Mm. And uh, you can contact me personally if you have any questions about what we spoke on the podcast. I do um, <clears throat> when uh, like 
regard a part of instincts, the you know running the organization and doing lectures also in Israel and, and also now online because I'm not flying too much right now. I'm waiting mm. uh, to open up a little bit more. Still, I'm doing a lot of stuff here in Israel. I also do a process, personal processes and consultation meetings uh, online. So mm. if you want to have something, uh, there is a list of things that I am, let's say, expert in, like obviously fear, anxiety, panic, phobias, OCD. The OCD, there is a course, if you would like to, to obtain, uh, available on, you, you'll get the link of that. Mm. And um, personal processes is possible uh, if I have availability for that. And um, also cons- one-time consultation meeting. This is also possible either through the website or just contact me personally. Personally, it's better to contact me personally because through the website, it goes through my team, to my uh, mm. customer service. And faster will be through me if you'd like. And uh, that's it. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Thank you uh, for the Absolutely. Have a good night. Thank you for listening to the Warrior's Den podcast. If you like this podcast and our content, make sure you support us in the many various ways you can. The easy and free ways start with liking, subscribing, following, and leaving a positive review wherever you may be listening or watching. You're listening to The Warrior's Den. The Warrior's Den. Brought to you by Urban Tactics Krav Maga turning lambs into lions.